Minerals, energy and agriculture, now more than ever, are vital to Australia's clean energy future, economic growth and prosperity. Since 2016, Geoscience Australia has applied science and technology in new ways through the Exploring for the Future program. By gathering, analysing and interpreting data at unprecedented scale and detail, we're building a national picture of Australia's geology and resource potential. So how do we know where to look for potential minerals, energy and groundwater buried deep underground? By analysing rock samples and water percolating up from below, measuring signals from earthquakes and lightning strikes, surveying and mapping with aircraft and seismic trucks. We are looking, listening, monitoring and recording what the Earth is telling us. We look across the country and image hundreds of metres below the surface to create a picture of what lies below our feet, resulting in a new generation of maps and data. Each set of data we acquire is valuable in itself, but when we overlay the data sets together in a way no one has done before, we start to see the full picture and gain a greater understanding of where we can make new discoveries. Australia has become a world leader in the science and innovation behind resource exploration. We're placing data directly into the hands of the people who need it. Governments and local decision makers, investors, explorers and regional communities, supporting informed decisions that make a real difference to all Australians. We thank the people and communities who collaborate with us to ensure the success of our program. Together, our work is supporting the transition to a sustainable, clean energy future, building tomorrow's industries and stimulating regional economies to ensure the prosperity of future generations. Welcome to the second session of day four of the 2024 Exploring for the Future program showcase. My name is David Robinson and I am the head of the Basin Systems Branch at Geoscience Australia. I'll be moderating this session on deep dives into the Birundudu, West Musgrave and South Nicholson Georgina regions. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people who have lived and shared culture in the Canberra region for many thousands of years. I want to pay my respect to their elders past and present. And I would like to also recognise our First Nations partners and traditional custodians of the lands we have accessed through this program. Finally, I extend a warm welcome to all First Nations Australians joining us today. As Marina said earlier, Today we are zooming into the regional scale. This follows the focus on national scale data collection and resource assessments over the last two days. If you missed any of these sessions or would like to access the outputs we are releasing, there are links available on the showcase webpage. The work we are showcasing was only made possible through extensive collaboration. We sincerely thank all our collaborators for their valuable contributions. We started the day with the mineral systems of the Dalamarian, and now we move on to regional projects focused on mineral and energy resources in the Northwestern Northern Territory. Paleo Valley hosted groundwater predominantly in Western Australia and groundwater in the South Nicholson and Georgia, Georgina basins on the Northern Territory Queensland border. There will be a Q&A session following the presentations. You can ask your questions of the presenters by using the Q&A stream at the top of your screen. The speakers are presenting on behalf of a large team, including many scientists, administrators and other professionals. If they cannot answer your questions, they will be happy to take it on notice via our email, eftf at ga.gov.au. Our first speaker is Paul Henson, who will talk about the Northwest Northern Territory Seismic Line, resource studies and results. Paul graduated from the University of Tasmania 
and is currently managing the Onshore Energy Systems Directorate at Geoscience Australia. He has extensive experience in the mineral sector, working on mineral systems in Proterozoic and Archean terrains. Since 2010, he has led the Australian Government's Onshore Carbon Storage Program, undertaking deep onshore drilling and seismic acquisition programs in collaboration with the states and industry. In addition, he now manages the Exploring for the Future Energy Program, leading a team of researchers to acquire new pre-competitive geoscientific data to improve our understanding of the geoenergy potential of Australian onshore basins. Thank you, Paul. Today I'll be presenting on the Northwest Northern Territory Seismic Survey and some of our scientific studies as well. Geoscience Australia, in collaboration with the Northern Territory Government, has acquired new regional seismic reflection data. The funding for this program was through GA's Exploring for the Future program and also co-funded by the Northern Territory Geological Survey. The survey displayed as pink lines is named the Northwest Northern Territory Seismic Survey or Northwest NT Seismic for short. The new seismic links with previously acquired industry and GA data to provide a continuous east-west transect across the whole of the Northern Territory, um, enabling broad geological understanding and also improved resource assessments. In a bit more detail, the Northwest NT seismic links with the Pangaea seismic in the north and also the GA acquired Tanami seismic in the south. The seismic covers an area of approximately 430 kilometres north-south and about 245 kilometres east-west and traverses the older Archean the Paleoproterozoic Tanami sequences in the south, the overlying Paleo to Mesoproterozoic Birundutu Basin, and the younger Neoproterozoic to Paleozoic sequences. One unique element of this survey was that the acquisition was exclusively at night time. This was designed to improve data quality by reducing wind and traffic noise. The approximately 850 kilometres of acquisition of the survey was acquired between the region in, of Timber Creek in the north and also the Tanami in the south. This is a frontier region with minimal previous exploration. There is, however, significant potential for resources in this region with stratigraphic units in the region similar age to the MacArthur Basin uh, to the east um, and also the Tanami to the south and also some heavy rare earths um, in the Brown Range Dome just over the WA border. To maximise geological understanding, interpretive stratigraphic correlations have been defined in this table from geological observations and also geochronology. The central column defines the central Birundutu region and compares it to both the Tanami in the south and also the Pine Creek in the north. Geochronology is both maximum deposition ages and also tuff magmatic ages and as you'll note here uh, we have quite a few 1640 um, MA ages from the Limbunya group. This age coincides with similar tuff ages within the MacArthur Basin and Mount Isa sequences demonstrating an active system was also occurring in the Birundutu Basin region at this time. I'll discuss in later slides some of the issues we found around the Birundutu group in Limbunya region and also relationships with the Limbunya to the underlying Invoy metamorphics. Look, the dominant fault orientation um, is trending west-northwest in this region um, and I'll just show you those orientations there. Uh, this includes uh, the Humboldt, Humbert fault um, and also Limbunya faults um, and also parts of the Negri fault. Uh, there is also um, an east-northeast trending uh, set of faults, including the West Bains and the Knee Fault, uh, and these are looking to displace some of the younger units, um, probably through the Alice Springs orogeny. Um, the west-northwest -north trending orientation is also um, represented heavily within the Tanami region. Uh, it was also evident that strain and deformation uh, was petitioned along these fault zones and we uh, saw that when we went out and did some field work in the northern part of the region where brecciation and quartz veining were commonly observed on these major uh, west-northwest trending faults. 
The seismic data was intentionally linked to the Pangaea seismic in the north and also the Tanami seismic in the south to enable transfer of information to the new seismic. Information from the existing drill holes was also used to provide geological information and this will be discussed in later slides. The gravity magnetic data have also been very valuable to compare structural and lithological interpretations and to assist in extrapolating interpretation into the broader region. Some linear gravity features um, have been compared with the seismic data in addition to some other features including the circular uh, gravity feature you see in the pink circle um, on the seismic line NT4 uh, displays similar gravity geometries to the granites in the Tanami. In order to describe the key features um, of the Northwest NT seismic, we decided to define four different zones, uh, the Eastern Zone, Northern Zone, Limbunya Zone, and also the Tanami Zone. To assist uh, interpretation of the new seismic, the Pangaea seismic was used as a point of reference as it directly ties in with the new NT1 seismic line in the north. These interpretations have been used to transfer knowledge extending from the Beetaloo Subbasin into the Northwest Northern Territory um, Seismic Survey. One thing of note here is you'll see the blue line that I've just put up. That uh, defines the unconformity at the base of the Limbunya group. Um, and what we see within the seismic is it, it appears to define the transition between the non-metamorphic basin sequences um, overlying metamorphic uh, basement sequences. As part of the acquisition, non-acquisition areas were defined due to road damage from flooding just prior to the acquisition um, or also from heritage constraints resulting in some of the blank zones that you will see within the seismic. To minimise imp impact from these, um, as that acquisition was specifically designed to ensure that fold was maintained to span these areas and also to image below them. In the eastern zone, the NT1 ties well with the Pangaea seismic line. You'll see that uh, dotted line there that defines the difference between the Pangaea on the right and the new NT1 line on, in the, um, on the left. And you'll see in the gravity image, uh, that black line defines uh, the area of the seismic that we're looking at. Reflectors are laterally continuous and there is no evidence of significant rifting. Uh, some open folding is evident uh, with some intermittent folding, uh, faulting. The base of the Limbunya group extends to a depth of about 1.3 uh, seconds two-way time in this area with one second uh, equating to approximately two kilometres in depth. The base of Limbunya most likely defines the transition um, of the non-metamorphic units in the basin overlying metamorphic basement units. NT1 part two, which is the southern extension, uh, displays similar flat lying reflectors uh, to the northern part of the line. Uh, reflectors are laterally continuous with um, the exception of some faults in the southern part of the line. Uh, preliminary interpretation uh, indicate that most of these structures are post-depositional. And overall, the eastern zone is a region dominated by rel relatively underformed flat-lying reflective units interpreted as base Limbunya group and younger overlying metamorphic basement. In the northern zone, line NT4 has enabled identification of a basin sequence dipping to the north to a depth of approximately 1.5 seconds uh, two-way time. Reflectors are slightly less uh, continuous than in the eastern zone, although like the eastern zone, there's no obvious stratigraphic thickening towards faults uh, in this seismic. Major structural offsets occur in the reflective packages at the interpretive faults uh, that may be normal or reverse offset, but they do appear to be post-depositional. The reflective units are interpreted to be base Limbunya and younger, overlying metamorphic basement units, which is the same as in the eastern zone. In the Limbunya zone, line NT3 images a zone of increased structural complexity towards the west. Major structures are imaged in the mid and lower crust, with major east dipping structures extending between the Negri and Limbunya faults. There is also a significant reflectivity change in the west of the, to the west of the Negri fault, which coincides with the deepening of the Moho. The Limbunya zone images thin sequences of upper crustal basin reflectors, most likely indicating basement is close to surface, and this is confirmed 
uh, by the Imbuway metamorphics also outcropping in the Limbunya region. In the Tanami zone, line NT2 extends north from the Tanami goldfields. The southern end of the line images significant structural complexity. To the north, there are a series of interpreted southwest dipping faults, with one corresponding to a large northwest trending gravity feature that extends up to the eastern edge of the Browns Range Dome that I've delineated by a pink uh, line there in the gravity image. Also, highly reflective, laterally continuous reflectors dip shallowly to the north, which are probably the Birinduta group. To complement the Northwest NT seismic, a series of resource studies were undertaken and the results published that you see here. This includes the new Birindudu Basin Inventory, providing an overview of the geology of the region. Most sampling was conducted on drill holes listed on the map you see for multidisciplinary analyses. I'm next going to highlight some of the new geochronology that we acquired and also prospectivity studies done within the region. New geochronology on five quartz porphyry sills logged as Birindudu group in drill holes LBD2 and LMDH10 in the Limbunya region were sampled with only LBD2 yielding suitable zircons for analysis. The log Birindudu group rocks also clearly display secondary metamorphic assemblages indicated by the Andalusites you see. The porphyry samples were analysed at GA uh, delivering an intrusive age of 1822 plus or minus 7. The Birinduta group as defined in the Tanami region has a max step age of 1768 from Cross and Crisp 2007 based on the underlying Pudgy sandstone. Based on the new 1822 age of the porphyry dated in LBD2, um, a similar age to the Wenicke granifier in the Tanami region of the birthday suite. The host sediments logged as Birinduta group in LBD2 are therefore more likely to be the Ware group and Tanami group equivalents. So what are the implications of the new dating? It's now likely that the initial interpretation of the Birinduta group occurring in LBD2 in the Limbunya region is incorrect. Dating of the porphyries now places the interpreted Birinduta group rocks as similar age to the Ware group, similar to the Tanami, so there are impacts to the stratigraphy of the units in LBD2. One interpretation is that the Birinduta group does not occur at this location at all and that the Stirling sandstone is still younger than the Birinduta group overlying the basement. Or two, the lower Limbunya group is equivalent age to the Birinduta group. Unfortunately, the current geochronology is insufficient uh, to define that and further work is needed to define this relationship in detail. So how do the new findings affect the interpretation of the units to the north of the Tanami? We now know a major structure in the seismic corresponds to a large feature trending northwest in the northern Tanami. We see in that black line there. And the new geochronology now correlates units in the Limbunya region uh, with the birthday suite, uh, with equivalent uh, age units uh, to the Tanami Ware group uh, to the south. Of note, these porphyries were sampled on the margin of a previously mentioned circular gravity feature that we see there in pink. Hydrocarbon studies were also undertaken as part of GA sampling program, collecting over a thousand samples from six drill holes. Analytical techniques included more conventional rock eval pyrolysis and organic petrology techniques, but we also undertook a pilot program using FIS and grains of oil inclusion. The image on the left shows the drill holes sampled and also the analytical techniques. Analyses were undertaken at both GA and also through external providers to um, gain this information. The most common mass rules consisted of alginite and bitumen, and the reflectors of these were used to estimate the thermal maturity of the rocks in the region. All the drill holes sampled demonstrate that they were thermally mature for hydrocarbon generation. The table on the right shows the location of alginite and bitumen in each of the drill holes. It is worth noting that the stratigraphic units in the drill holes AMP3 and WLMB holes are currently undefined. 
178 samples were analysed for rock of owl pyrolysis. However, a significant number of these were rejected due to low organic matter. The best hydrocarbon source potential was identified in the Malabar dollar stone of LMDH4 drill hole and based on the current sampling, the Limbunya group is interpreted to have the best hydrocarbon potential. The pilot program to assess the region using FIS and grains of oil inclusion confirmed the presence of oil migration in WLMB and ANT3 drill holes. But as previously noted, the stratigraphic units of these drill holes are currently undefined. So in conclusion, the Northwest NT Seismic, along with complementary science studies, has provided valuable data to assess the resource potential of this frontier region. Some of the key findings include the discovery of a previously unknown north dipping basin sequence coincident with a gravity low in the northern zone, major structures within the Tanami zone and Limbunya zone with a crustal scale feature located in the region of the Negri Fault. The extension of stratigraphic units from the Greater MacArthur Basin into the broader, uh, relatively flat lying eastern zone identification of structures in the seismic that will assist in exploration targeting for critical uh, minerals and resources. And rock samples were thermally mature for hydrocarbon generation. There is evidence for also for oil migration with the most perspective in the Limbunya group. New geochronology has now identified Tanami age rocks in the Limbunya zone, possibly extending gold prospectivity to the north. And look, overall, this is a region that displays enormous potential for future exploration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. It's impressive how many new things we learn every time that we collect more reflection seismic data and we date remote rocks. The wealth of new insights you and your team are revealing speaks to the importance of continuing pre-competitive geoscience in frontier regions like the Birindudu Basin. Josh Lester will now present Tracing Ancient Rivers, a hydrogeological investigation of the West Musgrave region. Josh is a hydrogeologist with the Groundwater Advice and Data Team at GA whose current work focuses on investigating groundwater systems in several arid regions of Australia. Josh holds a Bachelor of Environmental Science with honours from the University of Wollongong and previously worked in industry, primarily focusing on examining the hydrogeological impacts of underground mining. Thank you, Josh. Hello, today I'm going to give a quick overview of some of the findings of the recent uh, Musgrave Paleo Valley project. This project focused on investigating the hydrogeology of the West Musgrave region with a focus on the region's Paleo Valleys. Now, in case you're wondering what is a Paleo Valley, it's effectively an ancient river or valley that has incised its way through the local geology and has since been infilled with sediments. In many regions across the world, these are important sources of groundwater for a variety of users from environmental to anthropogenic. Likewise, these paleo valleys are found across Australia, particularly in its arid regions, which are currently used for a variety of things, including a source of water for critical mining operations in much of WA. We'll be going through this project in roughly three parts. Firstly, how we went about mapping these paleo valleys in three dimensions, how we went about understanding the hydrogeological processes at play here, despite having a bit of a lack of data, and how we went about integrating the two to understand groundwater processes at a few different scales. First, what is the Musgrave region? The Musgrave region is a large area of arid desert in Central Australia. It covers three states, several local land councils and traditional owner groups, and sits right on the corner of Northern Territory, South Australia and WA, which means communities, ecosystems and industries all rely solely on groundwater for their water supply, which means that managing water in this area in general is very important. Now, one of GA's former projects, the Wasamp project, identified several paleo valleys in the region. If you look at this map here, you'll see that the Cadgo, Serpentine, and Vanderlinden and Paleo Valley all take up large swaths of land in our study area. Now, groundwater in these Paleo Valleys is relatively underexplored, so worth looking into. Now, the geology in this region is mostly Cenozoic sediments that are underlain by the metamorphose igneous rocks of the Musgrave province. This generally acts as an aquitard, except where it's weathered or fractured sufficiently. 
and in this area a lot of communities seem to rely on these weathered and fractured zones for their water supply. See from the map again, you can see that it also overlies areas of the Canning, Gun Barrel, Amadeus and Officer Basin, with most features thought to drain southwards towards the Eucala Basin. Now where they exist in sufficient thickness, these Paley Valleys can contain an upper aquifer, the Garford Formation, and a lower aquifer, the Padinga Formation. Now it's thought that these Paley Valleys generally formed between the Late Cretaceous and the Miocene, with rifting and fluvial erosion uh, after Gondwana's breakup incising large valleys into the landscape. During the Eocene, the rivers change from more erosional to depositional, depositing the sands and gravels of the Padinga Formation, for drier conditions in the Oligocene, saw a break in deposition, and a renewed phase in the Miocene saw the deposition of the finer grain Garford, which in some places may act to confine the lower Padinga Formation, but has regional aquifer properties within itself, and within, especially within its various sand layers. The structure of these Paleo Valleys is largely unknown. Paleo Valleys are generally undifferentiated Cenozoic fill where, they don't ex where the Garford and Padinga Formation don't exist. But in this area, one thing that hampers investigations is very limited data coverage, very little stratigraphic drilling, and very patchy hydrochemical and water level coverage. So with such little geological info, how do we go about investigating these Paleo Valleys? Well, our tool of choice was Airborne Electromagnetics, or AEM. Now I'm sure you've heard about AEM previously, especially in Anand's talk on day two. But as a refresher, it is effectively a non-invasive technique that images differences in the conductivity of material with about the top about 300 metres of the Earth's surface. It's a powerful tool when you have ground validation sites such as stratigraphic drilling or bore logs, as you can use it to extrapolate results from these logs and look at the distribution or extent of geological units. So for this project, we acquired almost 20,000 kilometres of new AEM and combined it with existing um, AEM surveys, whether that be AusAEM or existing mineral surveys. Now these mineral surveys are about 2000 to 2012 vintage, and where we could, we reprocessed and reinverted this data to make using GA's one-dimensional layered earth GA AEM inversion code to ensure consistency throughout and give greater confidence in our interpretations. So you can see from this map here, we've got quite variable coverage ranging from about the 20 kilometre line spacing around the edges of the Oz AEM to the really, really high resolution surveys in the centre here in these pink purple polygons. Now they can get down to about 150 metre line spacing, so super high resolution in these areas. And importantly from our perspective, you can see in this depth slice here that there's really good contrast, especially over the Musgrave province. This blue resistor aligns with the igneous metamorphosed rocks of the Musgrave province. And you can see clear differentiation between that and the higher conductivity um, sedimentary fill of the Paleo Valleys or overlying Cenozoic. It's worth noting that this contrast wasn't as good over the basins, but still effective and reasonable for what we needed to use it for. Now, using this AEM data combined with bore logs and things like surface outcrop, we mapped the depth at which the boundary between the Cenozoic fill and the underlying basement occurred. We then combined that with a DEM and it gave us a good 3D representation of the Paleo Valleys, the Cenozoic fill and the ancient landscape of which they sit in. So from here we can look at things like the extent of these Paleo Valleys, the thickness of the Cenozoic and the structure um, in both two dimensions and three dimensions. From this we produce a few products. Firstly, we produce a base of Cenozoic sediments here that shows us how the ancient pre-Cenozoic landscape looked. And as you can see, there are large valleys in size into this area, and it really gives us a good idea of how sediments may have accumulated in this region. We also produce a thickness of Cenozoic map. Now this shows the thickness and extents of modern day Cenozoic um, sediments, and from these two products, we can have a look at Paleo Valley architecture, some basement highs that might affect drainage, and also get a reasonable idea of the extents of these Paleo Valley features. So one important thing that we managed to look at was to update the old Wasant mapping. As you can see here on Wasant over to my right, it did a pretty good job, um, but it was based on surface and satellite data. So if you look in the centre here, you can see that this area here has been mapped in much higher detail. And if you remember previously, this is where we had super high resolution um, old mineral surveys that we re reprocessed. This area is also covered by many dune fields which, as you can imagine, may obscure any surface or satellite imagery um, methods. So if we look here, you can see that our new methods has uncovered whole new areas of Paleo Valleys that we previously didn't know existed, and also refining the extents quite considerably. 
Now this is important for a few reasons, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with the logistics and costs of drilling bores that are like in this area. So we're hoping these products will make your life a little bit easier. Next, we have started to have a look at these Paleo Valleys in 3D. Trying to have a look at their Paleo Valley architecture. Now the depths of these are obviously variable, but on average are approximately 100 meters deep through their fairwegs or the deepest point of the river. For the Cadgo and Serpentine Paleo Valleys, these are the deepest and more over 100 meters to 120 meter deep on average. With some Paleo Valleys like the Cadgo and Baker having very obvious depot centers located generally along this boundary of the Musgrave province and off the basin. Most Paleo Valleys slope gently to the south into the Eucula Basin, with some more northerly features, such as the Docker River Paleo Valley or the northern extents of the Vandalinden Paleo Valley, draining towards the lower, lower elevations of the Amadeus Basin. Importantly, this technique was really good at picking up several locations of neotectonic disruption, where these new neotectonic features are likely to disrupt groundwater flow. So for example, if we look at this area of the Paleo Valley, Baker Paleo Valley, where it overlies um, both a neotectonic feature and the boundary of the Musgrave province, you see there's quite a bit um, of variation in its elevation. Now, this is likely to cause groundwater compartmentalization and groundwater mounding. And it will be really interesting to go out and see if it is indeed causing the formation of player lakes or salt lakes or like, or if there's only terrestrial GDEs relying on this groundwater mounting feature, if it does exist. So now we've got an idea of the physical characteristics of the Paleo Valleys, but what about the water inside them? Like I said, there's not a lot of existing data around, but using some hydrochemistry, we can get a rough idea of some insight of some regional trends in the area. As part of this project, we sampled 18 bores for an extensive array of analytes, including the normal physical properties, major and minor ions, as well as traces and isotopes, including CFCs, sulfur hexafluorine, tritium, stable water isotopes, isotopes of strontium, and a few more. We then combine this with a mix of legacy data from around the region, give us a database of about 200 bores with spatially and temporally variable data. What this showed us was that groundwater flow generally follows topography and salinity is generally fresh to brackish, with freshest water located near ranges and areas of enhanced recharge that generally gets saltier in the plains. Most Paleo Valley sources are brackish, however limited data is available from the headwaters, where groundwater is most likely to be freshest. Interestingly, we did find some elevated nitrate levels throughout the area. Now, elevated nitrate levels um, are common in arid Australia, but around the world are usually a sign of pollution from fertilizers or the like. However, in arid Australia, these are often seen to be caused by termites or leguminous C4 plants and their nitrogen fixing abilities. Now, interestingly, this study found a correlation between the existence of these elevated nitrate levels and sufficient calcrete deposits. We propose that these calcrete deposits might provide an environment conducive to nitrification with their relatively basic pHs, their high alkalinity waters, and their relatively fresh groundwaters. However, further work is needed to see if this um, pattern occurs in a wider arid Australia, and whether or not the soils that are presumably sourced from these deposits have any impact on the distribution of termites or this vegetation. As we have no temporal data or hydrographs, we relied heavily on isotopic and tracer data to understand groundwater processes. Recharge is highly variable from about less than 10 mils per year to about 100 mils a year across the region. Recharge is highest where features exist to concentrate and capture recharge. And these are usually colluvial deposits along ranges or in ephemeral riverbeds or any structures that act to concentrate and collect recharge. Um, these are also found along anthropogenic structures such as roads, which increase runoff into valleys or anything like that as well. There is minimal recharge on plains where so infiltration rates appear to be unable to overcome the evapotranspiration pressures in the region. And likewise, to overcome these evapotranspiration pressures, it appears that rainfall events of more than 70 mils a month are required to effectively recharge these systems. And most of these events appear to be sourced from marine aerosols or water that has evaporated from the oceans. Groundwater in the Cenozoic is generally young, less than 60 to 100 years. However, there are some older groundwaters around. These are usually associated with deeper sediments um, in areas of minimal recharge. So combining this physical um, characteristics of the Paleo Valleys with these regional hydrochemical insights, we're able to develop a conceptual understanding of how groundwater systems operate at a regional level. In our case, the Paleo Valleys we end up with seem to be these slow flowing systems draining with topography to lower elevations. 
These recharge near, near ranges or features that act to concentrate this runoff and usually through colluvial deposits along slopes. The rainfall events of about 70 mils or more that are required to recharge the groundwater system appear to have happened about 34 times in the last 70 years, however don't happen on clear cyclical trends. They more appear to be associated with monsoonal rains coming from the north. High evapotranspiration pressures on plains means very little recharge is seen in these areas. Water changes as it flows through the systems, becoming saltier, saltier through evaporative concentration, and this charge appears to be through outflow to adjoining basins, or through evaporation through salt lake systems, or transpiration through deep-rooted vegetation. It's also important to note that it appears to be a relatively well-connected well -connected system, with no real variation between the Paleo Valleys, the surrounding Cenozoic Fill, or the weathered or fractured basement systems directly underlying them. Now, while the major aim for this report was to characterize Paleo Valley groundwater, the integration of new AEM data and regional hydrochemical insights has allowed for further exploration of more local scale features like the Cobb Embayment. The Cobb Embayment is an eastern extension of the Canning Basin um, that overlies a study area. Limited drilling from the 1960s suggests that some sediments may have good aquifer properties. However, a scarcity of drill hole data has hampered efforts to fully understand hydrogeology in the region. By integrating our, our new AEM data, two distinct aquifer systems seem to be at play. One in the west appears to be a fresh, brackish, fresh to brackish system with a significant north-south extent. It seems to align with a conglomerate that aligns with this resistive big blue blob here on this map. Um, this thins to the east and is likely completely disconnected to its eastern arm. In the eastern Cobb embayment, uh, it appears to be a more brackish and more confined system, um, confined only to the Cobb formation. This outlines the potential of this area and the Cobb embayment itself as a regionally significant source of groundwater. Additionally, to support community water supply in the face of a changing climate and possible increased demand from industry, we use information from discrete historical investigations dating back from the 1950s, combined with our new IEM and hydrochemical data. We set out to look at groundwater surrounding seven local communities, looking at things like where supply is currently sourced from, theoretical flow regimes surrounding the communities, as well as other groundwater systems that might be nearby. What we found mainly is that only one of these communities, Kautuka Tajara, currently uses Paleo Valleys for any of its water supply. The others all appear to be supplying their water from fractured bedrock that directly underlies uh, the Cenozoic fill or calcrated drainages, and it's often located near ranges where we think runoff is highest. But however, many of these communities face issues such as limited supply and high nitrate levels. So it's hoped that this information can be used as a basis from which future work can be performed, effective management decisions can be made, and it's also an effective and easy way to return data directly to the communities from, which, from where this work was performed. So from this study, the study represents the most detailed investigation of Paleo Valley and arid groundwater systems in the region. We produced the first conceptual model of groundwater in the region, as well as detailed 3D mapping, and greatly improved our understanding of groundwater systems here and in arid Australia itself. It's also a useful case study to see how useful AM can be um, in areas like this to map features in 3D, especially in other data poor regions. We've also developed workflows that can be easily rolled out across large regions of Australia, where other paleo valleys are more relied upon for their water, such as Northwestern WA. So thank you for today. And here's a list of all the products that we produce as part of this project. And for any further inquiries, please feel free to reach out. Thank you, Josh. The mapping of paleo valleys using airborne electromagnetics is so powerful, especially to provide a context for the groundwater chemistry. It will be interesting to see how this groundwater is used and managed into the future. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Prachi Dixon Jane on water's journey, understanding groundwater dynamics in the South Nicholson and Georgina basins in the Northern Territory and Queensland. Prachi is a hydrogeologist in the groundwater geoscience section at Geoscience Australia and holds a PhD from the Australian National University. At GA, she has worked on a range of hydrogeology projects across Australia and in the Pacific. Prachi has a particular interest in groundwater surface water interactions and ecosystems that rely on groundwater. Thank you, Prachi.
Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining me. I'm going to start my presentation today by sharing with you this tantalising photo of Lawn Hill Gorge, located at the eastern boundary of the Georgina Basin within Queensland, just over the Northern Territory border. What is interesting about this permanent water body is that it's located in an arid part of Northern Australia, where you wouldn't expect to see this volume of surface water outside of the wet season. If it weren't for the presence of groundwater, which can outflow at springs and waterholes, this oasis wouldn't exist. Today I'll take you on a journey to understand how groundwater flows in the South Nicholson Georgina region, from where it enters the groundwater system, flows through rocks and sediments, and ultimately discharges. The South Nicholson Georgina Basin is large, having an area of roughly 380,000 square kilometres, which covers around a third of the Northern Territory and into northwest Queensland. Most of the region's towns and communities occur near the margins, including Daly Waters in the north, Bulia and Badari in the far south, Camuwil and Dumaji in the east, and Ali Karung over in the west. These locations generally have populations of several hundreds or less, with an estimated overall population of around 5,600. The surface area of the region is characterised by extensive plains with relatively flat to gently undulating topography, including the Barclay Tablelands, which is a treeless black soil plain stretching through the centre of the region and contains a number of prominent ephemeral lakes. The northern extent of the basin near Daly Waters is within the tropical climate zone with distinct wet and dry seasons. However, the majority of the region is arid with no distinct wet season and where the climate is characterised by large infrequent rainfall events, which are important for recharging the groundwater system. Importantly, the Georgina Basin hosts several large regional scale groundwater flow systems associated with Cambrian limestone aquifers and provide the only reliable source of fresh water in the region. Despite the importance of groundwater for communities, industries and the environment, there have previously been no comprehensive regional groundwater studies of the area. The Northwest Georgina Basin has received considerable scientific attention over the years due to concerns over proposed development of shale gas resources in the Beetaloo Subbasin, which underlies the Georgina Basin in the Northwest. As part of those investigations, there was a focus on the northern parts of the Georgina Basin, leaving the central and the southern areas relatively unexplored, with no studies in the south since the 1970s. Similarly, there's been no regional scale assessment of the deeper South Nicholson Basin, although this area has little groundwater extraction and also limited bore data available, and was therefore not the focus of this study. So, today I'll talk about our integrated desktop assessment drawing on a range of geoscience data to fill significant knowledge gaps about the regional unconfined aquifers of the Georgina Basin. Building this type of basin scale knowledge base is critical for ensuring sustainable use and management of groundwater resources that may be required to support new minerals and energy resource activities in the future. As mentioned in my last slide, groundwater provides the only reliable source of fresh water in the region. It provides the primary source of drinking water for communities, which means that maintaining groundwater quality and quantity is vital. On this slide, you can see the reliance on groundwater in the region, which in this dark orange area is greater than 90%. Industries rely on groundwater, such as pastoralism dominated by cattle grazing, as well as agriculture, mining and tourism. Groundwater has also been a crucial resource for First Nations people in the region and is associated with rich cultural knowledge and values which extend over generations. The final user of groundwater that I'll touch on is the environment. While it can be hard to see groundwater, ecosystems can provide a window into the role of groundwater in the landscape. In my first slide, I showed an example where groundwater discharge provides substantial flow to Lawn Hill Creek. Discharge of groundwater via springs and seeps also provides permanent flow to other watercourses, both within and outside of the basin, supporting aquatic groundwater dependent ecosystems. These sites of potential aquatic GDEs are shown on the map on the left. Vegetation can also rely on access to groundwater, whereby their roots draw on moisture from the water table up to 15 metres below the ground. These terrestrial GDEs, shown in the central figure in green, may require groundwater on a permanent or intermittent basis, providing a vital source of water to support their ecological function. Finally, there are subterranean groundwater dependent ecosystems, including steiger fauna and diverse microbial communities associated with caves and aquifers in the Georgina Basin further underlining the importance of groundwater for the environment. With that background on the importance of groundwater in the region, I'll now move on to talking about the regional geological framework, which is fundamental for understanding the movement of groundwater 
within and between geological basins. The South Nicholas and Georgina region is geologically complex with multiple stacked sedimentary basins ranging in age from Mesoproterozoic to Cenozoic that have formed at various times over approximately 1,500 million years of geological history. The schematic cross structural cross-section, which runs along a central axis from the northwest to the southeast, depicts the generalised stacked basin framework for the region. Key features to note are the South Nicholson Basin, which underlies the Georgina Basin, the younger Carpentaria Basin in the northwest, and the Aramanga Basin in the southeast, which is overlain by the Lake Eyre Basin. Understanding the structural and stratigraphic relationships between the basins is important for looking at the potential for interbasin groundwater connectivity, which I'll discuss later in the context of groundwater discharge from the Georgina Basin. An extensive review of the geology of the region can be found in the final report. What I'd like to point out for the purpose of this presentation are a few key geological features of the Georgina Basin that are important for understanding the groundwater systems within it. Firstly, the Georgina Basin is comprised mostly of Cambrian carbonate units, which are of equivalent age to rocks in the adjoining Daly and Wiseau basins. The development of cast features in these carbonates due to the action of water over time has enhanced their porosity and permeability or the ease at which groundwater can move through them. This has enabled the formation of a near continuous and extensive groundwater regional system across basin boundaries known as the Cambrian Limestone Aquifer. As previously found, the flow of groundwater in this aquifer is relatively slow in the order of metres per year. In the northern Georgina Basin, the Cambrian limestone aquifer is underlain by basaltic rock of the Calcaringi suite, shown in red on the cross section, which is regarded as a regional scale aquitard that limits vertical connection with deeper units. The Georgina Basin is also variedly underlain by proterozoic sedimentary rocks, as shown in the cross section. Overlying the northern Georgina Basin are Cretaceous sedimentary rocks, shown as the hatched area on the slide. This is significant as in some areas the thickness can be greater than 50 metres, which can impede recharge to the underlying unconfined aquifer. In addition, overlying younger sediments occurring across the Georgina Basin, such as those associated with the Lake Eyre Basin and the Aramanga Basin in the south, may be in direct connection with the Georgina Basin. An important structural feature is present in the centre of the Georgina Basin, known as the Alexandria Winara High, which has developed in the basement geology underlying the basin. This northeast trending structure, although subtle in the basement surface, is associated with a major groundwater divide in the Georgina Basin that effectively separates groundwater flowing north from groundwater flowing south. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Building on the geology is the hydrostratigraphic framework developed as part of this study, which enabled bores in the region to be assigned to hydrogeological groups and individual geological units within those groups to be assigned to waters bearing units or aquifers or units that don't provide water known as aquitards. This regionally consistent hydrostratigraphic framework provided the backbone for conceptualising the groundwater systems in the area. Drawing on bore depths, geology and existing bore attributions, a combination of manual and automated methods were used to attribute over 6,000 groundwater bores to aquifers which represents an approximately threefold increase in the number of bores that were previously attributed. What you can see in the map are the bores that have been attributed. The large number of green dots represent bores in the Barclay group, orange dots for bores in the Napa group, yellow from the Cockroach group, and some light blue bores over here in the, at the border from the Toko group. I've singled out these hydro hydrogeological groups as they contain geological units that are assumed to be hydraulically connected at the regional scale. This is an important assumption as it underpins our conceptualisation of the regional unconfined aquifers across the entire Georgina Basin. So where does groundwater flow in the Georgina Basin? Based on available groundwater level data for over 50 years from over 2,000 bores drilled in the Barclay, Napa, Cockroach and Toko groups, we constructed the water table surface you see on the slide. The water table occurs at higher elevations in areas with red and yellow colours and lower elevations in the light to dark blues, enabling three distinct areas to be defined, which correspond to distinct regional groundwater flow systems that are separated by groundwater divides shown as dotted lines. In the Roper River flow system, groundwater flows from the central groundwater divide at higher groundwater elevation to the northwest, ultimately discharging to springs within the adjoining Daly Basin. 
In the Lawn Hill Creek flow system, groundwater flow is topographically controlled, flowing towards the east and discharging via springs associated with creeks and rivers. Lastly, in the southern Georgina Basin flow system, groundwater flows from basin margins towards the central valley formed by the Georgina River and its tributaries, following a general southeast trend towards the southern extent of the regional unconfined aquifer. Spring complexes in the south enable discharge of groundwater from the aquifer. This regional water table map, which was previously only derived separately for the northern and southern halves of the basin, can now be used to understand groundwater flow across the entire Georgina Basin, which has implications for water allocation and management of groundwater in the region. I just described how groundwater moves within the three flow systems, but how does it get there in the first place? Numerous studies have previously investigated the variety of mechanisms by which rainwater can enter or recharge the unconfined regional aquifers of the Georgina Basin, which can be influenced by a number of factors, such as geological features, including the surface geology, the soil types, the presence or absence of intervening geological units, structural elements, as well as weathering features. There are also topographic effects, including the location of mountain ranges. Also surface water features, such as the location of ephemeral lakes, and climatic features, such as the amount and timing of rainfall, as well as vegetation cover. The relative importance of different recharge factors varies across the region and depends on local landscape characteristics and the interactions between them. For instance, as shown in this 3D view of the digital elevation model surface for the Roper River flow system, that was the one in the north, there are a variety of factors that influence recharge to the unconfined regional aquifer, including rainfall intensity, which may be higher up in the tropical area up here, thickness and lithologic composition of overlying Cretaceous units, and the presence of sinkholes and depressions. The ephemeral Barclay lakes in this flow system are also sites for groundwater recharge. Areas of enhanced recharge potential based on these factors are shown as, in, as hatched in the figure. In contrast, outcropping carbonate rocks and karstic features such as sinkholes in the Lawn Hill Creek flow system are the likely main controls on groundwater recharge, which occurs relatively rapidly in this flow system. In the southern Georgina Basin flow system, mountain ranges and associated flood out features, as well as carbonate outcrop and sinkholes, provide opportunities for groundwater recharge, with hatching on the slide indicating areas of enhanced recharge based on hydrochemical evidence. Speaking of hydrochemistry, another line of evidence we used to understand groundwater processes was to draw on existing hydrochemistry data from groundwater, springs and rainfall. You'll have to delve into the final report for the complete analysis of hydrochemistry data, but I thought I'd share some results from hierarchical cluster analysis of major ions based on around 2,000 data points from a variety of data sources. In particular, the hierarchical cluster analysis enabled us to confirm our interpretations of potential recharge and vertical hydraulic connectivity based on analysis of water levels and geological information and previous environmental tracer investigations. Some key elements to note in the map and the pipe plot on the slide for those of you familiar with it are that across all groundwater flow systems, cluster three bores shown in blue correspond to areas of enhanced recharge which can evolve to water types shown in purple cluster one or in orange cluster two. These blue bores correspond to areas of limestone outcrop, karst features, mountainous terrain, and ephemeral surface water features, all of which can facilitate recharge. The cluster two bores there shown in orange correlate with areas of reduced recharge and are characterized by groundwater with high salinity. Cluster four shown in red is distinct it has a distinct hydrochemistry compared to the other aquifers in the Georgina Basin, consistent with groundwater from the Great Artesian Basin. As with groundwater level data, hydrochemistry data has previously not been analysed across the entire Georgina Basin. However, there is still scope to improve our understanding of the groundwater system by collecting additional high quality hydrochemistry data, particularly in the southern part of the region. Knowing where groundwater outflows from the aquifer, a process known as groundwater discharge, is also a key component of understanding groundwater system flow dynamics. As shown in my opening slide, discharge of groundwater via springs sustains flow during the dry season in Lawn Hill Creek, as well as the Gregory River. Wetlands found on the eastern margin are also likely to be groundwater fed. As shown by preliminary geophysical analysis, groundwater discharge from the Georgina Basin to units in the South Nicholson Basin 
is also possible. There are also springs present in the north of the Georgina Basin and in the adjoining Daly Basin where groundwater discharge provides base flow to the Roper River. Numerous spring complexes also occur in the southern part of the basin, as well as persistent water bodies associated with river reaches of the Georgina River and Paturi Creek that we delineated from remote sensing data, which are all potential sites of groundwater discharge. It is also plausible that a component of groundwater discharge occurs from the Georgina Basin to the overlying Aramanga Basin, although there is limited available data at this point to make any firm conclusions. So just to finish up, what I've presented today is on the journey that groundwater takes in the Georgina Basin, from where rainfall enters the groundwater system, shown as the light blue areas in the slide, flows through the basin and ultimately discharges, shown in dark blue. As discussed, there are regional unconfined aquifers occurring within three groundwater flow systems, the Roper River, Lawn Hill Creek, and Southern Georgina Basin, each having their own recharge and discharge mechanisms. Now that we have a conceptual understanding of how groundwater flows within the entire Georgina Basin, this can aid sustainable management of groundwater for current and future uses of this critical water resource. Our recently released report contains a lot more detail than the snapshot I've presented here today. I hope this has sparked your interest and improved your understanding of groundwater dynamics in this arid part of Australia. Thank you, Prachi. The synthesis you showed of groundwater systems in this area, I'm sure will inform sustainable development, especially given the increased minerals and energy exploration in the region stimulated by the program. This brings us to the question and answer session. Our presenters are with us in the studio, ready to answer your questions. Please add your questions in the Q&A panel on your screen and include the name of the presenter you'd like to ask. To kick things off, I have an initial question for all three presenters. You have all covered very different regions across remote Australia. As you start your studies, what do you use to guide your work? And are there any overlaps in your approaches? And I might start with you, Paul. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, look, there's a range of different data sets and understandings that we use to uh, guide our programs going forward. Um, some of the work that we've done within the energy region um, is to look at um, uh, assessing the available data um, and the available understanding in those regions across, um, you know, large parts of Australia. Uh, one of the uh, systems that we've applied is to um, undertake basin inventories, um, and the basin inventory is looking, uh, it looks at all of the available data, the current understanding in those areas, and we try to work, you know, a couple of years ahead of our programs to make sure that we assess uh, those regions in advance and we can utilise that information to, you know, uh, design our programs and look at the specific areas um, that we will undertake work. Um, some of the other data sets that we use extensively are the magnetics, uh, gravity, radiometrics, which have a broad coverage across Australia. Um, and these are fantastic to, to hone in on, on specific areas. Um, also an understanding of, of what activity is being undertaken across Australia and, um, you know, industry undertakes a, an undertake a range of different um, exploration uh, throughout Australia. Um, and we can monitor that and, um, and utilise that as, as part of our assessment process for, for going into specific regions. Um, there is a lot of overlaps between, um, you know, the work that we undertake at Geoscience Australia, between, you know, some of the energy work, minerals work, um, you know, and also the groundwater work as well, where we utilise these same data sets um, to understand the regions. And these data sets are, are really critical in, in understanding where we go. So, look, I might hand over to... Um, yeah. some of our groundwater colleagues to, to have some comment on that as well. All right, thanks Paul for sharing that perspective um, from, from your side of the fence. Um, Prachi, would you like to comment? Um, yeah, similar to you Paul, um, you talked about the basin inventory. Well, um, in the groundwater space we have a hydro National Hydrogeological Inventory which was released last year um, 
my colleague Steve Lewis spoke about that last year through the EFTF showcase. So that um, having <coughs> that now at our hands um, is a really important tool for us being able to get an initial snapshot of a region, um, not only the geological inf or the, the groundwater information, but all the contextual information, the geology, landscapes. Um, um, and, and really it means that when we undertake these detailed inventories, we then have, we can hit the ground running. We've got something to start with, we don't have to start again. Um, as you also noted, being in a, a national geoscience agency, we have access to a whole lot of other geoscience data, not only groundwater data. Um, there's, um, and, and because in a lot of our studies, which don't stop at jurisdictional boundaries, um, having access to those national data sets is really critical. So for example, um, in the work that I discussed, um, we were drawing on some of the remote sensing information available through Digital Earth Australia, which is a national data set. Um, we also looked at some AEM interpretations and um, and then we also have the geological framework which is currently being developed, or the hydrogeological framework which is being developed nationally. Um, it's another important national data set for us. Certainly it's great to see those national data products being used. Josh, would you like to add something from a Musgrave point of view? Yeah, sure. I think um, both Prachi and Paula touched on those national data sets are quite helpful. But for our case, I guess the Musgrave area doesn't really have a lot of data in it already. Um, so I guess we're driven by two things, mainly like user needs and out in the Musgraves, that's mainly community water supply. There's a few GDAs and a few um, upcoming industry, but community water supply is the main need out there. And I guess the other thing is data availability, because when you have no data out there, I guess any data you can get is gold. Um, and I guess that's why a lot of our work focused on that central region where sort of um, <coughs> the old mineral AEM, mineral exploration AEM data um, was reprocessed and reused and relied on so heavily because there's just not that much out there. Excellent. Thank you, Josh. So we'll move now to a question from online, and it's come in from Richard Bluer, and it's for you, Paul. Yeah. Excellent to see the new data and interpretations in Northwest NT. Lots of new insights and challenges to old ideas. That's great. How well did the new seismic reflection data match the OzLamp and OzArray models? And any curiosities in the comparisons? I assume the new seismic was used in the Michael Dublier Major Crustal Boundaries 2024 release. I do note that most of these Australian projects were acquired in the southern half of your study area. Yeah, thanks, David, and, and thanks, Richard, for that question. Uh, look, there's there's a lot to this question. I think the first thing to note is that. Um, the seismic data was only just uh, recently acquired and processed, so we haven't had um, an enormous amount of time to link in with all the other uh, data sets that are available across that region. Um, the Oz Array models were primarily in the southern part of the um, seismic around the Tanami area, um, and there's still um, a bit of a uh, a gap in the northern part of the area that we, um, you know, that may be some future work uh, that will be able to be applied if if um, it's deemed to be the, the best way forward. Um, and that could link uh, with the current seismic that's just been uh, acquired. Um, with regards to Michael Dublow's uh, major crustal boundaries, um, I don't believe that that has been integrated yet because of the timing of it, as I've just um, spoken about, that it's only been very recently released. Um, but the other thing to note here is that um, it does uh, interact with a whole range of other different data sets. We currently um, also have AEM across the southern part of this area that we are still um, and currently assessing uh, that in relation to the seismic and other data sets in the area. Um, and there is multiple resources in this region as well. Um, obviously the Tanami region um, is a gold region. Uh, across the border in WA, we have Browns Range uh, Dome, uh, where we have heavy rare earths uh, that are, um, you know, a resource in that region as well. And then there is still to be assessed, um, you know, potential within some of the basin sequences to the north as well. Uh, that area is really has very minimal drill holes in it. There really isn't a lot of other additional information currently. Uh, but we are working up uh, the available drill holes in that area and we'll be um, integrating them in with uh, future interpretations of the area. 
Excellent. Thank you, Paul. And I might add, Richard, um, we are actually hoping to continue or planning to continue working in this region as part of the Resourcing Australia's Prosperity Initiative. So stay tuned for the first uh, RAP showcase and we'll loop back around on that question, no doubt. The next question is for Josh and it's from Marita. Most interesting work, especially the calcrete nitrogen correlation. But my question is, are there any hints of younger Paleo Valley sediments of Pliocene age? Oh, thank you, Marita. Um, there yeah. are the Garford Formation, which is, I guess, a stratigraphic top of the Paleo Valleys. That deposition did continue into the Pliocene. Um, but in terms of the younger geology, it's really not well understood that well out there. So a lot of it is just listed in a lot of geologic reports as undifferentiated Cenozoic. So I guess in my opinion, sort of the Garford is sort of the main top of the Paleo Valley sediments, but there, there's likely to be, um, I guess, other younger sediments in that stratigraphic column as well. Excellent. Thank you, Josh. All right, we've got another question for you, Josh, from uh, Gresley Wakalin King. Thanks for an interesting presentation. I'm wondering if the neotectonics or the paleo valleys had any surface expression in the landform sediments or types of country. Yeah. Um, well, in the, in the uh, terms of paleo valleys, I guess they still occupy um, what are topographic lows in the country. Um, the neotectonics, we didn't really find that they um, express themselves that well at the surface. And that's where something like the AEM was really important and could pick up these features that weren't readily noticeable from satellite data or sufficient features. I um, hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, look, I think it does, Josh. And uh, probably the only other thing I'll add, which I believe you touched on in your presentation, was how some of that uh, work you did, particularly with the geophysics to look underground, has been able to expand <laughs> our understanding of the Paleo Valleys based on the previous work done in the region through the WASANT program, which was largely based on the surface features. So that WASANT work did a reasonable job of identifying the Paleo Valleys, but um, what this new work you've led, Josh, has really shown that extra fidelity and detail you get when we use the AUSAM as well. So, yeah, thanks for that. We have another question for Josh from um, Steve Lewis. So there's certainly lots of interest in the, the Musgrave region. So great presentation, thank you. Two questions for you. So firstly, maybe we'll take them one at a time. Your conceptual diagram suggested that the lower aquifer system in the Paleo Valleys is combined, confined, sorry. Is there evidence for artesian conditions in any Paleo Valleys in the Musgrave region? Cool, um, thanks Steve. Um, for the first part, yeah, we did say that some of them, uh, some of these areas, the Paleo Valley lower aquifer system is likely confined. That's only when it's going to be sufficiently thick. So especially in the middle of, say, the Cadgo and the Serpentine, where it's 100 metres or so thick, um, there is evidence for, I guess, a confined system there. But where it is shallower, it's likely just one um, interconnected system. Um, and there's no evidence for any artesian conditions in the Paleo Valleys. Uh, in the Musgrave region. There's really not that much evidence for discharge at all there. Um, there's some evidence for some maybe salt lake systems or some um, discharge through GDEs. We think most of it flows south towards the Eucala Basin. Excellent, thanks Josh. So I think you've dealt with the first question. I'm going to give you that second question now. How applicable is the work uh, that you've done in the Musgrave Paleo Valley study to other arid zone areas of Australia? Awesome. I think it's very applicable to a lot of arid Australia. As you know, arid Australia relies completely on groundwater for all their water supply needs. Um, and there's large <coughs> swathes of WA, um, South Australia and Northern Territory that are covered in these paleo valleys. And I really think having this new detailed three-dimensional mapping process um, would really help, I guess, explore those paleo valleys for what sort of groundwater sits within them and... Um, Know, just lead to better management of these groundwater systems as a whole. Yeah, thank you, Josh. It's certainly excellent to see um, you making those links with some of the presentations from earlier in the showcase, like the three-dimensional uh, work around the um, chronostratigraphic framework for groundwater. 
All right, we've got a question for you now, Prachi, from Amon Lay. It's nice to see you, Amon, online. Your work on highlighting the recharge and discharge areas is fascinating, but I imagine these are based upon the available data and previous mapping efforts. Do you have any ideas on how to validate these interpretations and how this may inform how products such as the GDE Atlas should be used? Okay. Oh, thanks, Eamon, for that question. Um, I guess, uh, uh, as I said at the outset, this was a desktop study, so you're, you're right that the um, interpretations were based on available data. Um, <coughs> fortunately, there had been a lot of work that was done in the northern part of the Georgina as part of previous um, previous efforts when there was other interest in the basin. Um, um, and so there, there, were re there really have been a lot of studies done there already, so we have a pretty good handle on... Um, on the, the recharge and discharge processes there. Um, however, in the south, yes, it, it was really very much based on a lot of interpretation. Fortunately, even though um, there's not a good temporal data set um, for groundwater in that groundwater levels in that area, there is really good spatial coverage. So, um, um, with the available data, that that was the best we could do. Um, in terms of validating this, though, um, some field work, as as you would know yourself, um, would really help with validating those interpretations. Um, in particular, um, a big question for us is where does the where does the groundwater really go in the southern part of the Georgina? Does it does it go into the gab? Where is it being a lot being <coughs> lost? There are a lot of springs there. Whether they can account for all the groundwater discharge, we don't know. Um, so measurements of spring flow would be one start to try and help with that understanding. Also looking at isotopic information, um, going and collecting data from the springs that are there. Um, collecting data in, in the in the GAB bores at, at the same period of time um, could help us as well to validate. Um, and then the GDE Atlas, um, as, as many of you are aware, um, there are a lot of holes in that at the moment. Um, so this sort of information could feed back into the GDE Atlas, but at this point in time there's very little information, especially in the Northern Territory, regarding GDEs. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of a lot of things that could be done with a lot of field validation to help us. Excellent, thank you, Prachi. We've got another question for you from Zebo Zhu. Nice and informative talks. Just wondering whether you and your team tested the dis discharge areas, such as using geo geochemical traces to see the sources of water maintaining in these areas. I guess these rivers and creeks are intermittent. Um, good question. Thank you for that question. Um, so this was a desktop study. We didn't have the opportunity to collect any geochemical data to in, in order to look at different water sources for um, for the surface water features, if that's what you're referring to. Um, uh, the, the rivers and creeks within the Georgina Basin are, are um, intermittent, you're correct. Um, however, there are a number of um, streams outside of the Georgina Basin that are maintained by groundwater and they do have persistent flow um, such as around Matarenka you've got the Ropa River there um, in the north off to the north um, which is sustained by groundwater from the Georgina Basin um, then you have the, the Lawn Hill Creek and um, Gregory River to the east also sustained by groundwater from the Georgina Basin so um, that's of course based on available information that we have at this point in time without necessarily using geochemical traces, because we can look at things like stream flow data, um, which others have looked at in the past um, to help us understand the persistence of some of those surface waters. Um, but yeah, going forwards, it would be really great to um, collect additional data um, targeting those sort of questions about water sources to the surface water features. Excellent, thank you, Prachi. All right, Paul, I, I actually have a question for you. Yeah. So. In your talk, you covered how the reflection seismic profile and complementary geoscience studies have revised the stratigraphy of the region and identified new resource potential in the area. You concluded by saying that the region has enormous potential. In your mind, what are the key outstanding science questions now and what are the key studies required to fill them? Yeah, thanks very much, David. Um, yeah, look, I think there's quite a few um, science questions that we would like to answer out of this um, area. Uh, based on the available data, there's uh, some significant um, components of stratigraphy in the broader region that need to be defined uh, better. 
Um, so one example of that is looking at uh, the central zone within where the where the seismic was acquired around the Limbunya area and comparing that down into the Tanami region. Um, we have some available geochronology data in that area um, and that has uh, provided us with some um, clarity about the uh, relationships in the stratigraphy between that area and the Tanami region in the south, which is relatively well defined. Um, but, you know, additional geochronology data would, would assist with that. Um, and I'll just go a little bit further to say that the relationship of the Birundudu uh, Basin and the stratigraphy um, in that Limbunya area uh, has not been compared uh, in direct terms to the Pine Creek area. However, there is to the north. So, however, there is some very significant uh, similarities between uh, the stratigraphy in the central part of the Birundudu and Pine Creek. Now, you may ask, well, what's the, what's the relevance of that? Why do you need to know, um, you know, the stratigraphy? Well, there is, um, you know, potential mineralisation at that um, unconformity that we see between metamorphic basement and, um, and the basin sequences overlying it that we see up in the Pine Creek region. We also see um, across the border in WA where we have uh, heavy, uh, heavy rare earths occurring at that unconformity um, at age 1640 MA. Um, and also we need to understand uh, the stratigraphy in relation to any potential mineralisation that we see within the Tanami region, uh, which could be extrapolated potentially northward. Um, and also some of the other mineralisation that we see in the broader region. So one of the things that I think we really need to sort out in the area is the stratigraphy within the broader area. Um, and I will even go as far as to say that we haven't pushed across into Halls Creek as well, which is another poorly defined area. Um, but there is a lot of potential there as well. There is a known uh, graphite resource in, in the Halls Creek area. Um, and so there's other resources that we, we need to tease out to, um, you know, to understand. So additional work in the area would be really looking at, you know, understanding the stratigraphy. Um, we're also looking at, um, you know, potentially analysing some of the other exi existing drill holes in the area. And then ad additional um, geophysical acquisition would also assist um, in that process. Um, anything from airborne AM to, you know, to seismic, um, you know, and if there was any other um, potential, you know, even drilling in the area could be a, a potential way to, to understand it better as well. So, look, I think the science questions here are really quite broad because the resource uh, potential in the area is broad as well. Uh, on top of that, we don't understand um, all of the relationships from the Beetaloo subbasin to the east. Uh, we do know now through a continuous seismic line that we can track all of those sequences into the area. So there's also that as another um, major component of work as well, David. So, um, you know, there's some of the things. It certainly seems like there's plenty to do and no wonder we have our eyes on that as you know, one of the first projects to kick off yep. under wrap. All right, we have another question in now for Prachi and it's from Stephen Lewis. Did your study make use of any national scale data such as the AusAM data set to help better understand the hydrogeology of the region? If so, can you explain how these data were used? Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, so, um, yeah, we did we did dabble in um, looking at some AusAM data. It um, didn't turn out to be um, a, a major component of the work just due to time constraints, at the, um, but it was used to undertake a case study to look at um, some of the, the spring sources um, on the eastern, at the, at the eastern boundary of the Georgina Basin to see if that could help us unravel um, the, well, the source, the source of water for some of the springs that discharge into the South Nicholson Basin. Um, so um, that that preliminary work, which could be rolled out to look at other um, other parts of the basin, that that techno that technique could be used in other parts of the basin as well, to try and look at some of the interbasin connectivity. So what we did, what <laughs> we the preliminary findings that we had by using the AusAM.
were to show that there could be a component of um, groundwater from the Georgina Basin flowing into the aquifers of the South Nicholson Basin. And that was by looking at the, the springs um, and other, um, other structures. So, yeah. yeah thanks, Prachi. It's certainly interesting to see that we're able to extract that sort of uh, ele um, information from the 20 kilometre space, DOS AEM. I, I know nothing will ever beat the um, higher density surveys, but where we can get information from the broader space yeah. surveys, um, really, yeah, a lot of potential there. So, thank you. We have another question for you, Prachi, from uh, Martin Smith. Great presentation. What additional work would you like to see to help better understand the connectivity between the Georgina and the Gab and the Weezo Basin? Okay, so um, thanks for that question, Marty. Um, so the connectivity, oh, ha having some on-ground data would really help. We've, we've pretty much explored all of the existing data that we could, um, but some targeted um, geochemistry information in particular, hydric geochemistry information in particular would be helpful um, to have a look, look at that sort of connectivity. Um, so I'm not familiar with uh, the range of isotopes that could be used, but there would be some isotopes involved, um, and which would involve taking samples at preferably the same period in time um, from bores in the Georgina, the Gab and the Wiseau Basin. And, um, tapping into different formations because we don't actually know which geological formations might might be connected if they are at all. So, yeah, Excellent. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Prachi. All right, Josh, I have a question for you. How do you think climate change will affect groundwater availability and quality in this arid system? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, I think this is a really interesting question for this area because on one, uh, one hand you've got I guess the increased evapotranspiration and sort of heat and dryness pressures. Um, but on the other hand, if we're correct in saying that this area is only recharged through massive, or not massive, but heavy rainfall from cyclonic events and um, monsoonal rainfall traveling south, then climate change is expected to bring, I guess, greater intensity, greater intensity of these cyclonic events, more frequent um, recharge events. So. Um, I guess we're not really sure who will, what will win out. Will the greater evapotranspiration um, cause issues or will the greater, the hypothetical um, increased recharge in this area sort of win out? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll see, I guess. F fascinating problem to throw your mind at, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Thank you, Josh. All right. I have another question for Paul, actually. So having looked through the core in this region, can you comment on your view of the mineral potential within uh, the region, and in particular the Birindudu Basin, as opposed to within the basement? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, yeah, look, we have looked at quite a lot of core within this region, um, and also I'll add to that that we did do a, um, a short field work stint as well in the northern part of the Birindudu. Um, and the relevance of that is that we saw that most of the, um, this, you know, any form of deformation that we saw in the region, it's generally quite flat lying. However, the strain is petitioned to those um, major structures that we see within the area. Um, and I think there's quite a lot of importance to um, investigating those, those major structures in the area with, with regard to any um, potential uh, mineralisation in the basement sequences. There's also uh, known occurrences of sulphides within um, within the core that we've assessed within the area, um, and you know that's already been logged to a certain degree. However, there would be a lot more um, you know potential work that could be undertaken on on the existing cores in the area. Um, Bear in mind that they are focused um, on specific areas um, and there's large parts of the Birindudu Basin sequence that don't have any drill holes in them at all. Um, so as far as the mineral potential in the area, um, you know, there's definitely um, occurrences, mineral occurrences. Um, we have seen in the field that, you know, there is uh, great potential along some of these um, major structures that we see. Um, and you know, I think that the mineral potential within the basin sequence is definitely there. Um, however, there would be a requirement to do quite a bit of additional work to assess that um, in a more quantitative way. 
Excellent. Thank you, Paul. So we have another question for Prachi from Richard Blewett. Pardon my ignorance, Prachi, but <laughs> are the springs in the Georgina discharging hot water? I know Mataranka to the north does. If so, what is the source of the heat? Oh, good question. Um, I will have to say we had very limited spring data for this piece of work, which is unfortunate um, because they might have been the key to understanding some processes and source aquifers. Um, uh, yeah, we didn't we didn't actually assess any of the springs in the north. So thank you for that information about the hot springs in Mataranka, which is might explain why people like going there. Um, in the south, that's where we did have uh, some springs data from historical work done in the um, in the GAB, and um, some of those springs <coughs> are 40, 50 degrees temperature. Um, so that water is coming from a confined aquifer. Um, so it, it's and, and deep down. So it's no surprise it's that that water is hot. So um, yeah, I think just, just due to where it's sitting and the confined nature of that, that water, um, that's why it's hot in that region. I would expect that the springs that are discharging to the east, however, um, which are sustaining flow in a couple of big rivers, the Lawn Hill Creek and the Gregory River, um, perhaps that water's not so hot. Um, I don't actually know, but if they are sustaining ecosystems there, you'd have to have special ecosystems that don't mind it, mind the heat there. Yeah, yeah. fascinating. Thanks, Brachi. All right, Josh, another question from, from me, actually. So in your study, you began to grapple with the groundwater system in the region. What is your greatest outstanding science question in the Musgrave region? Oh, well, thanks, David. Um, I think there's two main questions that remain unanswered. Number one is based around the stratigraphy of these paleo valleys themselves. The only data we really have is from one mining operation in the middle of the study area. Um, I believe it was on Oz Minerals. I think it's now BHP, West Musgrave Project. <coughs> but effectively, that's the only stratigraphic information we have. Um, so without having proper stratigraphy, then I guess you can't have proper hydrostratigraphy. Um, so we just extrapolated this throughout the region, but we really have no validation of this. And secondly, there's a real lack of boreholes targeting paleo valleys. Um, besides uh, Kaltuka Tajara slash Doka River, um, <coughs> there's really... You know, one or two, and that, sorry, in that mining operation, there's only a few bores out there that are actually um, directly access groundwater in these systems. So, a lot of, again, a lot of our, I guess, conclusions are extrapolated out from um, nearby Cenozoic systems that aren't necessarily Paleo Valley systems. So, I guess, yeah, figuring out the stratigraphy slash hydrostratigraphy of the Paleo Valleys themselves and getting more samples to really look at water directly in the Paleo Valleys. Excellent. Thank you, Josh. So we'll have to draw the Q&A session to a close now. I'd like to thank Paul, Josh and Prachi and everyone who attended today's sessions. If you would still like to ask a question or make contact, please email us at eftf at ga.gov.au. The showcase will continue in about 30 minutes at 3 p.m with our next session, Groundwater Systems of the Kunamona and Upper Darling Barker River, along with some reflections on the showcase from our science advisor and a look forward to the Resourcing Australia's Prosperity Initiative from Andrew Heap. Remember that the link for this session will work for the next session. If you missed anything from today's showcase or would like to re-watch something, the recordings will be available in the coming days on our showcase webpage, ga.gov.au forward slash showcase. We look forward to seeing you again shortly. Thank you.